study. Um, we've been looking through the book of books, I suppose, of First and Second Thessalonians, and we're continuing to do that. We're coming near an end of chapter 3 now, uh, there in Second Thessalonians. But I know uh, myself, as I've been studying, there's some uh, wonderful thoughts that we've been able to look and study and cherish in those books. So we do give each and every one a warm welcome again to another Thursday night Bible study and prayer meeting and as you've heard me say over the past year as we've been uh, sending out these as time for prayer as well and I trust you'll be able to give some time at the end of the Bible study to spend time in prayer for all that is happening in these days. Uh, the news uh, is getting better, it's getting easier to listen to, uh, it's getting easier to see maybe coming to an end and coming to the beginning of being able to come back together and having fellowship together. So we're looking forward to that, we're praying towards that end but while we're still here we'll continue the Bible studies online so we do give you a very warm welcome uh, again tonight. Uh, please do remember the Thursday night uh, Bible studies there in your prayers. Uh, they'll be online on YouTube and Facebook there quarter past eight on a Thursday night and then remember our Sunday morning service as well uh, there at 11 30 and that will be on YouTube and Facebook as well it was lovely to have the drive-in service uh, there again uh, last week and uh, we're back to our uh, Facebook and back to YouTube as well but it's great to be able to get uh, these things and to be able to put them up in these days just want to thank Coulter again tonight it's always nice to to lead uh, at the beginning with a hymn or a song or a chorus and appreciate Coulter doing that and then putting it up for us so we'll bow together for a word of prayer and then we'll uh, read together God's word and we'll spend time uh, just looking into the word let's pray our loving and our gracious heavenly father we just want to thank you for all uh, that is happening in these days we do thank you that you're a God who who shows us the next step you're the God who leads and guides and you're a God who wonderfully directs we thank you you're the almighty all-powerful one we realize you spoke this world into existence. You're the great creator, God, and that you created each and every one of us. Uh, you remember Adam and Eve there in the garden, how you created both. And then we've all come from Adam and Eve. So we thank you for that wonderful privilege we have of knowing that we have a great creator, God. We thank you that you tell us in your word, you give us life and breath and all things. And Lord, we thank you that you're able to give life and you're able to take life away and blessed be the name of the Lord. So we come to you the, tonight afresh, realizing the great God that you are. We thank you for just being with us, and we know that where the twos or threes gather together, and although we're gathering together online, we're still gathering together. 
And Lord, we're, we're longing for your blessing. We're longing for that sense of your presence. We're longing for that anointing upon the ministry and the challenge that comes from your precious word. We thank you there in Timothy. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we'll be looking at these little thoughts in, in, in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. We'll come to the point now where the word of God or the truth is not being rightly divided. And we'll know that that brings a challenge to our own hearts to be careful with the truth, to uphold the truth, and to rightly divide the truth. So Lord, we look to you tonight afresh. We pray, Lord, you'll bind us together, you'll bless our time together, and Lord, you'll lead us on into prayer together. We do thank you, you're a God who hears, and you're a God who wonderfully answers prayer. So we're looking to you tonight. Bless us through your word. Bless us together in prayer. Lead us on with yourself, because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, I'm sure you know by now, we're turning there to uh, 2 Thessalonians and uh, we're into chapter 3. And really we're looking at the last uh, number of verses of this chapter and yet we're dealing here really with church order. And uh, one thing that is important uh, that we've been looking at and I've seen the importance of it here, Paul was dealing with the early church. And even in the early church, there was disorder and there, was, there were those who were unruly. And Paul was dealing with them. And sometimes we, 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 try, to, we try to sidestep issues that are uncomfortable for us. When, when, when sometimes we, we just have to simply deal with them. And Paul felt that there were things going on here in the fellowship in Thessalonica that he really had to deal with and that he had to go over. So we're going to read uh, these uh, number of verses together and really from verse 6 down through to verse 18 and we're going to read uh, those few verses together and I said this really dealing with church order. And verse 6 it says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labour and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example or example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And we trust God will bless his, the reading of his precious word uh, to our hearts. Now, as I said, we're dealing uh, with church order. And we've been looking at this for a number of weeks. And there were, um, there were different and difficult problems within the fellowship here. We know one was uh, regarding the, the dividing up of the scriptures. And really what they were doing is they were waiting for the second coming of Christ. And yes, we wait, but we work as we wait. We continue on with life. It says that when the Lord returns, he will come as a thief in the night. And the reality of that is true from Scripture. We won't know the day nor the hour, but the Scripture says, Be ye so doing. And we looked here that they were idle and they weren't involved in any work of any kind. And it brought a burden upon the fellowship and it brought a burden upon the other Christians. And we're, we've been looking at a number of thoughts already regarding this in verse 6. 
We looked at the advice of the word. Now there were, I suppose, four separate motives that Paul said, listen, we'll pull you out of this wrong teaching, out of this wrong doing, out of this wrong way of life, and put you onto the right path that will keep you straight. And the first thing we looked at was the advice of the word. And Paul has used the word command here a number of times, and it's been passed down from the top. As Paul said, listen, it was passed from God. It's been passed down through the inspiration of the word. And then it's been passed down to you. And the word of God is inspired. And you take that word and you take our example of living that word. And you live out that word for yourself. And one of the things we looked at here was not only the word command that it was given. But we looked that it was given in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, that's his humanity, that's his deity, uh, that's his, his, his human name, that's his divine title, that's the reason why he came. He came to be the saviour of the world. And we looked at all of those little thoughts. And folks, the reality of that was, it was given with authority. The second little thought we looked at was... And I suppose before we got to this, I did say last week, I nearly forgot, um, the the little thought we brought when a a laborer or a believer uh, cannot work. It is the privilege and it is the responsibility and the duty of the church to help them in any way possible. And I said that we would look at two little portions of scripture. I mentioned them there last week. And the two little portions of scripture give us a little challenge. And I want to look at them tonight because sometimes we think, well, listen, if you don't don't work, you don't eat. But there are some people because of, of difficulties of life, because of the problems they're going through, because of health situations, they're unable to work. And yet the church should be there for them to help them in that task. And the first little one is in James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. It said, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man shall say he hath faith and have not works? In other words, faith without works is dead being alone. And the reality is we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. But we are saved, as the scripture says, unto good works. By your works shall ye know them. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, though a man say you have faith? Listen, I have a faith. I have a saving faith. I have a faith that is real and have not works. Doesn't show itself out in works. And the reality is for the Christian, by your works shall ye know them. And here it says, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. If they've nothing to wear, if they've nothing to eat, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Look, folks, it's easy to give lip service, isn't it? And it's easy to say, Oh, listen, I trust you're warm, but they've no clothes on. I trust you're filled, but they've nothing to eat. He said, Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, if it had not works, even so faith, if it had not works, is dead being alone. Notwithstanding you give those things. In other words, folks, within the church and within the church situation and within the reality of the Christian life, if somebody doesn't have clothes and they need them and you're able to give them to that person, folks, we should be giving them. If they haven't got food, folks, we should be giving them food. We should share out of our own abundance. And the reality is, folks, sometimes we can be hard and heartless when we're to be soft-hearted and we're to be generous. And, folks, the reality here, it says, listen, faith without works. In other words, you live out that faith. In other words, you show out that faith as you're helping others. Turn over as well to 1 John First and second Peter and then first John and chapter three and verses sixteen to eighteen. And this is what it says in verse sixteen. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought also to lay down our lives for the brethren. Listen, Christ has laid down his life for us. Folks, we are to be prepared to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters in Christ. But whoso hath this world's goods, seeth his brother have need, 
and shutted up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In other words, if we truly love the Lord and if we truly want to live for the Lord, folks, we'll show that out. If there's a need and we're able to help meet that need, folks, we will do it. And that's the wonderful thing about the, the bowels of mercy. That's where true love comes from. It doesn't come from the heart. It comes from the bowels. It comes from the inner man. And folks, that's where we should learn to be generous. And folks, as I was telling the, the story as I finished last week, the, the truth was it, it kind of upset me last week when I heard it uh, uh, about, about two people who were in private rooms in a hospital. And another person passing away. And the nurses asked if they, would, if, if, if they would give up their rooms. So that the family could be together with their loved one who was passing away. And the reality is, folks, they said they wouldn't. They said they wouldn't. And folks, that should never be in the church. Or it should never be in the life of the, of the believer. Because we should prepare to give up. Sacrifice is the giving up of something special for the sake of something else. So that the item given up will attain a great personal cause. Folks are we prepared to sacrifice for the cause of Christ? Are we prepared to sacrifice for one another? To give. And sometimes give till it hurts. Not out of our abundance. And Paul then went on. Not only the advice of the word. But he went on to the, the archetype. Of the apostle. And what the, 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 the archetype means. The model of the apostle. He said listen. We have, we have given out a model. We have, we have given out a, a design. That you are to follow. And folks it, it was in the believers lives. That they were to live it out. Listen. As you had looked at us. As we have worked with you. Folks this is the way you are to live out your life. And the apostle Paul had the, the right to expect financial support. And, and you know folks we can, we can look at many things and we can say many things and we look at it maybe later on. But the reality is the scripture says every man is worthy of his hire. But Paul here deliberately gave up this right so that, that he might be an example to other believers. And there in verses 7 to 10 it says for yourselves know how you ought to follow us but we behaved or not ourselves disorderly. We didn't go out of rank. We didn't do something we're supposed to do. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. You know we didn't expect you to feed us but wrought with labor and travel night and day because we know Paul was a tent maker. Listen he worked night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power. Not because we're not supposed to be supported. Not because we're supposed to be looked after. Because we are. But it says not that we, not for even, not because we have not power. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Even when we were with you, this we commanded you. That if any would not work, neither should he eat. So Paul deliberately gave up his right. Paul said, listen, I have the right to give it up. And folks, I am giving up that right. And I am going to work so that it doesn't bring a burden on the fledgling church. And the church is able to go forward. And folks, he left it as an example for other believers. I want you to turn back with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. And 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And there in verses 6 to 14. It says, or I only, and Barnabas, Paul is speaking of himself here, have not we power to forbear working? Have we not power to, to give up working and to concentrate fully on the ministry? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planted a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit, fruit thereof. Listen, look what he's saying here. Listen, the soldier goes to war. He's supported in the war. The, 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 the husband man who looks after the vineyard is, a, a partakes of, of the grapes. And he said, who feedeth the flock and eateth not the milk of that flock? Listen, look, the flock is there. We're able to milk the goats or able to milk the sheep. And who partakes of that milk? And he goes on to say, Say I these things as a man, or saith not 
the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treaseth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plough in hope, and he that trasheth in hope should be partaker of this hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, it is a great thing. If we shall reap your carnal things. Folks, we have sown spiritual things. We don't want to reap carnal things. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And he was going back to, to the high priest. And the high priest was looked after because part of the bullock that was sacrificed went to the high priest for his upkeep. And what he's saying, listen, even in the, in the olden days, even in the temple, the high priest and the priest who was offering sacrifices daily was looked after because he was given part of the sacrifice. They which wait are the altar are partakers with the altar. So he said, listen, they were getting... Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And folks, can I say over nearly 30 years of ministry, God has been so good. Through his people, God has been so good in providing for my every need. And folks, when I left home, I left home having worked and worked hard and had, had a living. And folks, then I went into the work of the Lord. And every step of the way over those years, the Lord has provided. Now, folks, it hasn't always been easy. But God has been so good. And God has provided through his saints. I remember leaving in the faith mission a number of years ago, leaving an island, the island of Tyree. And I remember coming out of, of, of uh, in the last meeting, we were there for, for two or three months, Paul Atchison and myself. Uh, and, you know, people gave us gifts to just put money into our pocket. And, and, and time after time, the folks of the island would have said to us, Mervyn or Paul, listen, that's just a wee gift. Get yourself a, a something, a sandwich or something to eat on, on the boat as you're heading home. And folks, that night when we went back to when we went back to the house, our pockets were full of money that people had given to us. And you know, folks, people were good and they were generous. I don't know what type of sandwich you were eating on the boat on the way home, but people were so good. And right up to this very day, can I say, and can I say publicly, people have been so good in giving to the work of the Lord and supplying the need. And folks, this shows Paul's authority here as a Christian leader. Paul was saying, yes, I can receive that money. Paul was saying, yes, I'm entitled to that money. But he says, I give up that entitlement. Because I want to give you an example. Listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. And folks, I think it shows a true example of a leader. Because, you know, I read a little quotation and I want to read it out to you. It says, selfish leaders use people to build up their support and they're always claiming their rights. I'll read it again. Selfish leaders use people to build up their support and are always claiming their rights. Dedicated leaders use their rights to build up the people and will lay them aside for the sake of them. Folks, I trust we're dedicated leaders. We're prepared to lay aside our rights. So that the people under us are built up. Are built up in the gospel. You see, Paul set an example in, la in labor. To appeal to the people in the church who were idle to go and work. Paul so set an example of meeting his own needs and helping to meet the needs of others and not be a burden on the church and to see the work of the church go forward. 
That's why Paul said here in verse 9, not because we have no power, but to make ourselves an example unto us, unto you to follow us. And folks, isn't that really what we should be? You see, the challenge here to us is to be an example. And the greatest influence that we can have is that of godly living and that of sacrifice. And folks, if we can live out our lives as leaders, as church members, as folks belonging to the church, if we can live out our lives as a living sacrifice for others to see, that's the greatest example that we can ever have. And Paul said as a Christian leader, he wanted to lay it out. And then he wanted to lay it down for people under him. And folks, it has to start at the top. It doesn't matter. And it has to work its way down through. And a Christian leader may appeal to the advice of the word. And that's what we looked at. But if he cannot appeal to the, the example of obedience. If he cannot appeal to the, to the prototype or, or the astrotype. Or the example of obedience. Then people are not going to listen. You see there are two thoughts before us here. And with these quickly I finish. There's one of authority. And there's one of stature. You see, a leader earns statue as he obeys the word and serves his people in the will of God. A leader earns statue as he obeys the word and serves his people. And a leader has authority because of that, because of his leadership and because of his authority. And can I say, folks, many people have authority as far as leadership is concerned. But they don't have stature. They don't have stature. You see, stature earns the leader the right to use his authority. You see, if people think something of him, then the reality is, folks, they, they, will, they, will, learn to, they will learn to accept what he has to say. You see, if a, if a leader just completely rules over his people, he's just taking his authority, then the people are not love him. The people are not even like him. And the reality is stature comes from, from practice and it comes from example. And folks, we can't have stature without authority. Yes, there's many who have authority, but they have no stature. As far as the people are looking at them, they have no stature in front of the people. And can I say, every Christian leader has the right of support from the church. And we, we can look at that and go over it as he or she serves the Lord. But we must not use Paul's example as, as, I suppose, an excuse not to support. Some people are saying, oh, well, Mervyn, listen, maybe you shouldn't get paid. Maybe you should be out working. Well, well, that can be right. There can be reality in it. But the reality is we shouldn't use it as an example. We shouldn't use it as an excuse. The reality is in this particular situation, that was Paul's right. But in other situations down the years, folks, it's only for the faithful giving of God's people that has been able to see the work going forth and has been able to see the work prosper and the work blessed. And folks, can I say it's the responsibility of us as Christians to support missionaries, to support pastors, to support to, to, to support workers within church, with, within evangelism, within whatever sector. Folks, if they need support, it's our responsibility to do it. Paul decided here to live his life as an example. Paul wanted to encourage the young believers. And I trust folks, as Paul did that, he encouraged them to work. And he encouraged them to labor. Because, folks, if you encourage someone to labor and work in the physical work of life, well, then you'll encourage them to labor and work in the spiritual work of life. Can I say Paul's policy silenced his accusers because he wasn't doing it for money. He wasn't doing it because he was going to get a pay packet at the end of the week or the end of the month. He was doing it because he said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Can I say the sad reality here was they were false accusers. They were false accusers. 
And can I say many who are preaching the gospel today, they will find the same false accusers. Oh, listen, I wouldn't want to be involved with them. I wouldn't want to have anything to do with them. Paul didn't want to be associated with anything that was wrong. He wanted to be associated with all that was right. And sometimes I notice, folks, they're very quick today and be very careful how you use it. Because people are very quick to take up that evangelical and that word and tag it on to every situation. I was speaking to somebody there during the week and, and there was something that had cropped up. I'm not going to go into the details. But they just said, oh, it wasn't, wasn't that an evangelical church? Isn't that the same as you, Mervyn? You see, the reality is, folks, it, when, when it does that, Paul didn't want anyone to, to say that he was associated with them. Paul didn't want anybody, wouldn't want anything to say that he was associated with wrongdoing. That he was only doing it for the sake of, of money. But Paul wanted simply to say that he was doing it free of charge. Because he wanted to get the gospel out to men. And the reality is here, the most important thing is that we get the gospel out to men and women. Because people need to hear about the Lord. And Paul said, I wasn't doing it for money. I wasn't doing it for any high accolade in these verses. He said, I was doing it because I long to preach the gospel. And I long that men and women will be saved. And I trust that little thought has been a, a challenge uh, just to your own heart and your own life uh, this evening. Folks, we're just going to go down to prayer. Uh, I just want to bring a few thoughts uh, to, tonight for prayer. Uh, do especially continue to pray for uh, the work of the church, uh, for the work of mission organizations in these days. Uh, it's good within our own uh, system. We're able to get up the Thursday nights. We're able to get up the Sunday uh, morning service. And it's good to be able to see the Sunday school coming up online there at half past ten. Or sorry, quarter past ten uh, there. No, half past ten on uh, the Sunday morning. So that's good. I was glad to see it up. And we trust that God will bless that. And to the boys and girls as well. It'll be a help uh, to their hearts and to their life so please do please do uh, remember uh, the work of the church as a whole and i know many are looking on from other churches as well and we do pray for the for the for the church family uh, as a whole we pray for every church as it continues to preach the gospel excuse me and as it continues to keep the gospel going uh, please do pray for missionary work as well that God will bless and that God will use uh, missionaries in these days and in a different way and in a different aspect. Uh, pray too very much as we said there's drive-in service and we had one ourselves uh, there last week. Pray, pray for them as they continue. Uh, it's good to see that over in the north they're back uh, but here uh, God willing very soon we'll be getting news that we'll uh, be able to get back and have fellowship uh, together as well. Pray for those who are sick. And there's many within uh, the church circles. Uh, there's many family uh, that certainly need prayer in these days. So please do remember them uh, in prayer and the family circles. Pray for those who mourn and uh, that God will bless and that God will comfort and help them. And do pray especially for uh, the land as a whole. Uh, you know, there can sometimes I believe there can be a fear out there. Uh, we've been we've been away. We've been a kind of isolating for nearly a year now, on and off. And uh, you know, I know that brings with it a fear. But I always go back to that lovely little verse in in Isaiah, in Isaiah forty one and ten, where it says, "Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you with my right hand." So we pray for our land. We pray for a move in our land, and pray that God will bless and that God will save. Uh, precious souls. 
So let's go down to prayer. I'll lead off, folks. I won't spend long uh, tonight. We'll go down to prayer. We'll get into prayer together. And we'll pray that God will bless. Our loving and our gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again tonight that we can be gathered together in your name. We thank you for your wonderful hand upon us. We thank you for your leading and guiding and direction upon your word. And we thank you for Paul's life and witness and testimony. We thank you for, the, for your word that challenges us about different things. And we pray, Lord, afresh tonight as we looked at that little thought on finance and giving and supporting. Lord, we pray that it will be a help and a blessing and a challenge to us as Christians. We pray, Lord, we know what it is to be warm and generous of heart. We know what it is to be, to be giving. And Lord, sometimes we're living in a world that can, that, can, that can take and take and receive. But Lord, we pray that we will be givers. And Lord, that we will give generously from our hearts. We pray afresh, O oh Lord, that you will undertake in these days within the work of the church. We thank you for the different ministries that are going on within church life. We thank you for mission organizations that are able to put out the gospel. And we do thank you for them. Lord, many are doing open air work. Many are doing drive-in services. Uh, they're able to go back to church up north and go in and have fellowship together. And Lord, we thank you for these opportunities. And we pray, Lord, as tracks go out, we pray, Lord, as the, uh, on YouTube and Facebook and Zoom and other ways that the word is getting out, we pray, Lord, that you will wonderfully bless. So we look to you and we pray, Lord, that you will undertake. We pray for those who are sick especially and those within our family circles and, Lord, those within within the church circles that we know and, and, and we, we love in the Lord and we just pray Lord that you will undertake there's many who are not well and Lord within our family circles as well there are those who certainly need prayer so we look to you and we pray Lord that you will touch and that you will heal according to your word according to your will we do pray we do thank you Lord that we can remember those who mourn and Lord we pray that they truly will know the comfort that only comes from yourself you tell us I will not leave you comfort but I will come to you and for our landlord we pray that you will break in that you will do a fresh work and a new work and Lord that you will do a work that we never thought possible these are difficult days uh, where we can look for the gospel but yet the gospel is going out and it's going out to the uttermost parts of the earth so Lord we pray you'll take us as a witness you'll take our lives and may we be witnesses for you not easy in these days but Lord we pray that you will take us use us and help us, we pray. Lead us on in prayer now. And go before us, we pray, into prayer. And Lord, may we touch your throne of grace. May we know here. Uh, and Lord, may we touch your ear tonight afresh. As the psalmist of old said, give ear. Lord, put your hand behind your ear. So Lord, that you will hear me. And that's the cry of our hearts. That's the holy boldness. That's the, that's the heavy burden we have. That you will come and you will hear. Because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen.